So good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Vivian. I'm the Manager of Entrepreneurial Services with the City of Brampton, and I'm delighted to be your host for this morning's webinar on Tax Sense for Small Business. This session is hosted by the City of Brampton's Entrepreneur Center in partnership with MIP. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Entrepreneur Center, we're an innovative partnership between the province of Ontario and the City of Brampton belonging to a very large network of small business enterprise centers across the province of Ontario that offers entrepreneurs various tools and resources to help them start and grow their businesses. We are a one-stop resource providing information, education, access to a number of different programs and services, as well as great webinars like today. Um, you can learn more about our center by visiting www.brandzone.ca backslash BEC. Um, and we also encourage you to check out the Small Business Centre of Ontario website uh, to find a small business centre closest to you. Um, it is www.sbcontario.ca. Uh, we would like to pay special attention to our series partner, MNC. Without their generous and ongoing support of our centre, event series like this would not be possible. I also want to uh, flag that MNP has generously sponsored an amazing phone booth uh, that you can use uh, if you're visiting our space at 41 George Street. MNP is a leading national accounting, tax, and business consulting firm that is truly made in Canada with offices and communities all across the country. MNP supports small businesses as they grow and innovate and helps business owners adapt and succeed in a dynamic business environment. The Business Insights section on MNP's website provides timely advice and practical solutions to help you navigate your business journey. Visit mnp.ca to learn more and subscribe to the MNP Business Insights newsletter. Uh, before we begin today, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. First off, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you later today, along with a copy of today's presentation. There will be lots of time at the end of today's presentation for Q&A. Everyone will remain muted, so we ask that you please use the question box on your participant control panel to type in your questions. In the event we're unable to get to your question this morning, um, or if there's something that you think about asking after today's webinar, you're more than welcome to email us or the presenters directly. Uh, with that being said, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We're going to speak to you about the legal structure of your business and important small business tax considerations. Uh, Jacob Angamir is a Canadian tax partner working out of MNP's Mississauga office. Jacob specializes in estate and succession planning, working closely with business owners to develop strategies that best suit their short-term and long-term objectives. He also identifies other planning opportunities to optimally structure an organization's business activities to minimize their tax burden. Tushar Gol is a, man, a senior manager in the domestic tax group in MNP's Mississauga office as well. He works primarily with the private enterprise group to provide tax compliance and planning services to owner management, sorry, owner managed corporations and high net worth individuals. Uh, please give them both a very warm welcome. Great. Well, thanks, Jennifer. And, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, it's nice to be uh, be back uh, presenting again. Uh, so as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we're sort of going to go through the, the basics of uh, sort of taxation and considering um, business structures uh, and how, how business income is taxed, whether you're operating through a corporation or personally, and, and just some things to consider uh, as we're getting closer to tax time and tax filing and uh, just provide a bit more information. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with uh, talking about the different types of business structures that there are. So there's three main forms of business structures that you can choose. Uh, the simplest being a sole proprietorship uh, and then the other common one being operating through a corporation. Uh, there is Another option where you can operate as a partnership, but we're not going to get into that in this presentation. Uh, it's um, similar to a to sole proprietorship, but uh, there's a lot of nuances there. Uh, we're going to focus on the difference between a sole proprietorship and uh, and a corporation. So a sole proprietor, as I mentioned, is the simplest uh, form of sort of operating your business. 
uh, you do not have a separate separate legal entity. You're really just operating as yourself. Uh, you may have a trade name that you operate under, but uh, but everything kind of flows through your personal income tax return. Uh, personal and business funds can be commingled without any without any issues uh, from a tax perspective. Uh, really, you are the business as yourself. Uh, a corporation gets a bit more complicated where uh, a corporation is a separate legal entity uh, from you, the shareholder, uh, running the business. Uh, and then a corporation has shares which dictate who owns what pieces of the business. The simplest example is if you just had your own small business and you decided to incorporate, you might be the 100% shareholder of your own corporation. Uh, there is more, a lot more flexibility with a corporation. Uh, one of the, the uh, things you can do is you do not have to have a December 31st year end. Uh, as a sole proprietorship, you file your taxes based on the calendar year. A corporation, you can pick any year end. Uh, so that could be beneficial if, um, if uh, your busy season, for example, is January, February, March, and you don't want to have a December year end, uh, you could pick another time where your business might be slower uh, and then do your taxes sort of in the off season. So here's just some other um, high level overview of uh, the differences between the two. Um, one thing is the, uh, the legal liability. This is also a very common reason why people incorporate. Um, as a sole proprietor, as you are the business, uh, if, if a supplier or, or creditor or someone were to sue you uh, as a sole proprietorship, you're personally liable for everything. Uh, that, that includes any other assets that you own not related to the business. Whereas with a corporation, typically speaking, uh, you're uh, limited to, if, if someone were to sue the corporation, you're limited to the assets of the corporation. There are exceptions where directors can be held liable, but uh, for the most part, it does offer much more protection than operating as a sole proprietorship. Uh, in terms of filing tax returns, as I mentioned with a sole proprietor, it just goes on your personal tax return. You pay your personal tax rates as if you received a, a T4 from, from employment income. Uh, and then a corporation has its own tax re return uh, with its own rates that we'll get through uh, in more detail shortly. And the tax rates as, for a sole proprietor based on the marginal tax rates so for Ontario, that's as low as 20% and goes all the way up to 53.5% if you earn more than roughly $220,000. Uh, and in a, corporate, a corporation, you uh, the first $500,000 of business income is generally taxed at a lower rate of 12.2%. Uh, anything else is taxed at 26.5%, whereas investment income is subject to a higher tax rate at 50%. Uh, corporations costs a lot more to start up and just uh, in terms of ongoing filing fees. Uh, so the, the benefits have to outweigh that extra cost of setting up a corporation. Uh, if you're looking to sell your business, uh, it's pretty hard to sell a sole proprietorship. You might be able to sell a client list or the goodwill of the business, but uh, you can't really sell the ownership of that sole proprietorship because it's just you. Uh, then the other kind of important fact here is uh, that pretty much everything in terms of taxation, other than the rates that you're paying is the same. So what sort of your revenues, your expenses, what you can deduct, uh, almost everything is the same, whether you operate as a corporation or a sole proprietor. Uh, I think a common misconception is that if you have a corporation, you get access to all sorts of write-offs that you wouldn't have if you were a sole proprietor, and that's generally not the case. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the, some more details on the taxation of business income and uh, Tushar is going to, to take over here. Well, thank you, Jacob. Good afternoon, everyone. And as Jacob just mentioned, so I will now be talking about some details about how the taxation of your business income is handled. Uh, next slide, please. So the taxation of your business income really depends upon your business structure, whether that is a sole proprietorship or a corporation. And as Jacob just discussed, both structures are subject to different tax rates. So you have to pay tax on your net income, which is calculated as the revenue that you earn by providing goods and services, less the expenses that you incur to earn that income. 
And this will be covered in greater detail in the bookkeeping webinar, which I believe is in early November, early November. But we want you to note that you have to maintain financial records regardless of your business structure in order to calculate what we call your accounting net income. So from starting from your accounting net income, you then have to calculate your taxable income by making adjustments on, your, on that accounting net income for specific items. And then once you get to that taxable income, that's ultimately what you pay tax on. So next slide, please. So a general rule of what you can claim as an expense against your taxable income, and this works for both accounting and tax, is asking yourself if that expense was incurred for the purpose of generating income. So some examples listed here include, um, and the examples are of eligible expenses, office supplies such as paper and stationery, the cost of any physical goods that you are selling to your customers, salaries and benefits that you pay to yourself and your employees. This includes any bonuses that you pay to yourself uh, provided that they were actually paid within 180 days after your year end, amounts that you pay to any subcontractors you may hire for your business, licensing and business dues, um, business insurance, rent for an office space or just business operations in general, utilities and telephone charges, and any fees that you would pay for attending conferences and training events. Next slide, please. So now we get into differences between treatment for certain expenses between accounting and tax. Basically, how do we go from our accounting net income to our taxable income? So an example is golf club fees. So these are never deductible for tax. So you would add them back 100% when calculating your taxable income. You can claim business portion of your auto expenses like fuel, insurance, repairs and license, and parking for business purposes only. And we will cover this in more detail, but what we mean by business portion is that you take your total expenses incurred throughout the year for the vehicle and you prorate them based on the business kilometers you drove during the year relative to the total kilometers that you drove during the year. And you can claim home office expenses, which has been a very popular topic ever since the pandemic started, given how many people are now working from home or under some sort of remote model, remote or hybrid model. For any individual sole proprietors, you have to meet the criteria of regularly meeting clients at your home office, or that home office has to be your principal place of business in order to deduct those home office expenses. Now for a corporation, the corporation can claim the home office expenses as a rental charge to the shareholder against their shareholder loan balance. So what we mean by that is that the corporation claims the expense on their corporate tax return, and that portion is owed to the shareholder at the year end because the shareholder is the one who paid for those expenses for. And to further explain what we mean by business use of home office expenses, and this is similar to auto expenses, is that regardless of your business structure, you take the total of your home expenses um, incurred during the year, including repairs, property taxes, utilities, you prorate that total amount over the square footage of your home office versus the total square footage of your residence. Next slide, please. Now, for meals and entertainment, you have to add back 50% of those expenses when calculating your taxable income. And it's very important that you separate these expenses out from your general advertising expenses. So when it, when it comes time for your year end, you can figure out what the add back amount is. You can, however, claim 100% of the meals and entertainment costs if those costs are available to all staff members, but this is only allowed for up to six events during the year. Now, for any fees that are incurred to obtain loans or other forms of financing, you have to add back the fees amount um, 100% when you calculate your taxable income. And what you can do is claim that over five years, or think of it as you claim 20% every year. Uh, you should note that if you repay the loan over before the five-year period ends, you can deduct the remaining unclaimed fees at that time. Uh, next slide, please. So now we will get into more details on auto expenses that I touched on briefly before. So as a sole proprietor, you have to track all your auto expenses with receipts and a logbook to figure out what your business mileage was relative to the total mileage during the year. You can then claim your allowable auto expenses by prorating them using the business kilometers driven. Now in a corporation, if a shareholder or employee owns the car personally, they are entitled to what we call a per kilometer allowance, which can be claimed by the corporation as an expense. And this allowance is not taxable to the vehicle owner. 
Now for 2022, the reasonable allowance is calculated as 61 cents for the first 5,000 kilometers driven and 55 cents for every additional kilometer driven. Now it should be noted that these amounts include HST and if the corporation is registered for HST, it can claim that portion of the allowance paid as an input tax credit when they file their HST returns. Now, I know that was a lot of information, but what we want to stress in our presentation is that when we see CRA sending letters out to, regardless of its sole proprietors or corporations, when they want to verify auto expense claims um, in the calculation of business income, they want to see that you have a logbook that details the business trips that were taken during the year, the purpose of those business trips, and the business kilometers driven during those business trips. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be a paper log that you provide to the CRA. There's, there's a lot of apps these days that you can access to maintain that driving log, or it can be even some sort of spreadsheet that you maintain manually. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're moving on to due dates for making our actual tax payments to the CRA. And a corporation has to pay the tax either two months or three months after their year end which we will talk about later when we're discussing the small business deduction. But the actual corporate tax return has to be filed within six months after the year end. So this creates a bit of a timing difference, which means that the tax may have to be estimated and paid to the CRA before the actual corporate tax return has been filed. Now for an individual sole proprietor, they still have to pay the tax by April 30th, just like any individual filing their tax return in Canada. Um, however, for a sole proprietor, what they can do is they can file the tax return by June 15th instead of April 30th. And this extended deadline also applies to their spouses, so the spouse of the sole proprietor. But once again, note that the tax still has to be paid by April 30th. So there is a bit of a timing difference here where you'll have to estimate and pay that tax by the end of April if you are taking advantage of the extended deadline and filing by June 15th instead. Now, to assist uh, business owners and corporations with not having to pay a large tax bill at the payment deadline time, what the CRA does is that they require that installments be paid throughout the year. Yeah, and this, uh, this installment requirement kicks in if your final tax liability for the year before exceeded $3,000. And for both individuals and corporations, um, from what, what we've seen is that CRA does a really good job of sending installment reminders before those payments are due throughout the year. Excuse me. Uh, so therefore, what we want you to note is that you're prepaying the estimated tax throughout the year, which should ideally help you avoid cash flow issues when it's time to make the final payment to the CRA because you've been making those installments throughout the year. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Jacob mentioned this briefly, but depending on your business structure, you have to pay tax at the different tax rates in Ontario. Now, in a corporation, once you have calculated your taxable income, so you had your you did your bookkeeping, you have your accounting income, you made adjustments, and you got your taxable income. On the first five hundred thousand dollars of that business income, you are entitled to what is called the small business deduction, and the tax rate on that income is twelve point twenty percent in Ontario, and this includes both the federal and provincial components. Now, for business income that you earn in excess of that five hundred thousand the high general tax rate applies of 26.5% in Ontario. And investment income that you earn through your, through your corporation, like rent and interest income, so this will be taxed at the rate of 50.17%. But it should be noted that the effective tax rate on investment income is actually 19.5% once the corporation has paid a taxable dividend out to the shareholder to recover the refundable portion of that 50.17% tax rate. But for this presentation, we will not be getting into the mechanics of refundable tax in detail. Now, the tax rates provided for corporate income here are strictly, are strictly limited to the corporate income only. This means that the individual shareholder will still have to pay tax, um, will still have to pay personal income tax, sorry, when the after-tax funds are extracted from the corporation. Now, on the other side, if you have a sole proprietor, they would pay tax at their personal marginal tax rates. And in Ontario, this combined marginal tax rate can vary between 20.05% all the way up to 53.53%, depending on the total taxable income that the individual earned during the year and what tax bracket it puts them under. 
Now, the sole proprietor, it should be noted, they are liable to pay both the employer and employee portion of CPP on the self-employment income earned during the year. Now, we've presented the different tax rates here, but we want you to note from this webinar is that once a business owner extracts money from their corporation, whether that's through a salary or as a dividend, so our tax system is designed in a way that theoretically, there should be no difference between earning that income personally um, as a sole proprietor or through the corporation first. And this concept is what we call integration, which Jacob will now talk about in more detail. Great. Thanks, Jitar. I saw a question come in. I'm just going to answer it uh, quickly. Uh, so the question was regarding uh, uh, liability protection. Uh, would having good insurance as a sole proprietor be just as good as having the liability protection with a corporation? Uh, the business has low liability risk and under 30,000 of annual revenue. Uh, I'm, we're not lawyers, so I can't, can't really say for certain, but I, I would say probably given this situation, uh, having adequate insurance cover, coverage for a relatively small business is probably good enough. But uh, as always, you should consult kind of your, your lawyer and uh, insurance advisor just to make sure that you do have sufficient coverage. But I think generally for a business that's smaller, it typically doesn't make sense to uh, incorporate uh, un unless there's some uh, like, uh, liability potential with the business uh, in a certain industry. Okay, so we'll move on to this concept of integration. So here's just an overview of some tax rates and I'll explain uh, what they what they mean. Uh, so we'll go through the left side first. Uh, so this is your small business income, that first 500,000. Um, so in the corporation, you pay a tax rate of 12.2%. Um, so now that money is sitting there, you have roughly 88 cents on the dollar. Uh, if you use that money in your business, you don't have to pay any more tax if it stays in, in, in a corporate entity. Uh, when you take that money out, it comes out as a dividend. Uh, and the combined tax that you pay by taking it out as a dividend and paying the corporate tax is that flow through rate, that second line of the 54.12%. Uh, and you'll see the, the comparison to the top personal rate. So that's if you took either you earn the money at the top tax rate over 220,000 as a sole proprietor, or you paid yourself a salary from the corporation uh, and you were at the top tax rate, you'd be paying the 53.53%. So the actual savings uh, of having a corporation, uh, you'll see here there's actually a tiny cost, uh, but it's almost 0%. So you're, if you're just earning income in a corporation and taking that all, all that money out and not reinvesting it or keeping some money in the company, uh, you're really not saving any tax by having a corporation. Uh, the real benefit is that second last line, the, uh, the deferral line, uh, where you're deferring 41% of the, the tax that you're paying, or 40, 41% of the total income uh, is being deferred. And that's a significant portion of tax that you're not paying up front that you can use to reinvest in your business or purchase other, other corporate investments. So that's really the main adva advantage of a corporation is that tax deferral line. And you'll see on the, the income that's subject to the higher tax rates of the 26.5%, if you don't get that small business deduction or if you're earning more than 500,000, uh, the rates are pretty similar. There's a slightly higher tax cost to flowing it through as a dividend uh, of 55.42%, uh, but you still have that significant 27% deferral. So that's really the, the, uh, the main advantage. So this next slide sort of just reiterates exactly what I just said. Uh, other than the, like, from a tax perspective, so not including the liability and other business reasons it may make sense to incorporate, uh, the greatest advantage is the tax deferral. And that deferral is only possible if you keep the money in the corporation. Uh, so I think that's a common misconception, as I mentioned, that incorporating is this great thing that you'll automatically save tax. Uh, you really need to be in a position where you're not spending all the money that you're making. If you're taking it all out, and there's no other business or legal reason to incorporate, then it's probably not time to incorporate because uh, you're just end up paying 
more money in, in compliance fees to file your tax returns and to legal fees to incorporate and maintain the minute books. And you're not really saving any tax by, by doing so. So some of these I already mentioned, uh, the legal liability and compliance costs. Uh, another big one is really the simplicity of your operations. Uh, if if the, uh, the tax deferral is not at play for you and you have a very simple operation, if you're just uh, maybe a consultant working on your own, you don't have any employees, uh, then maybe corporate incorporation doesn't make sense. Uh, if you start to build a team, your operations have increased in size significantly, then, then it might be time to start thinking about incorporating. Uh, and the last point that I touched on was the saleability of your business. Uh, if this is something that uh, you're looking to sell in the future, you're looking to build the business out and sell, uh, incorporating makes it easier to sell uh, your business. And there's also the possibility for the lifetime capital gains exemption. Uh, if you have an active business in Canada, there's certain criteria that need to be met but uh, there's just over $900,000 per person that you can receive tax-free on a share sale. And that's only applicable to corporations. So if you have a sole proprietor and you're selling it, you won't be able to take advantage of that uh, without first having a corporation. So just some things to consider. So here's sort of a, a practical example of what really happens when you have a corporation and you're you're doing your year-end planning and looking at uh, how the math works with the taxes. Uh, so you really have to look at how much money was taken out from the corporation for personal use. Because at the end of the day, there, there could be timing differences that span over years, but a simplified example, whatever you take out during the year is what you have to pay personal tax on. So in this example, say you've taken $200,000 from the corporation, from your income, uh, from the income that was earned, uh, 20,000 of that was business expenses. So you personally paid for expenses that are deductible to the corporation because they're for business income earning purposes. So of the 200,000, 20,000 gets reimbursed to you tax-free. So you're left with 180,000. Uh, of 100,000 of that was net salary that you paid yourself if you're the sole shareholder. So uh, as a share, as an employee of your own corporation, you can set yourself up on payroll as if you were an employee of another company uh, and pay yourself payroll every every month or every, every week or two weeks, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then you make your normal CPP and income tax withholdings to CRA, uh, just like a regular paycheck. Uh, if you're the, the owner of the company, uh, you're not you're not making EI withholdings, so that's really the only difference. Um, and then that net paycheck you get, uh, since you've already made the withholdings and that's going to be on a T4 slip, uh, that comes off of what you have to pay tax on as well because you've already paid the, the personal income tax with the tax withholdings. So now we're left with $80,000 left that you haven't paid tax on. Uh, and this is sort of what happens every year. This calculation is done to look at how much have you taken out that you haven't already paid tax on, or if it wasn't a reimbursement for a business expense. And the simplest solution uh, is to pay that have the corporation declare a dividend. And what that does is that uh, clears the amount that's that's been withdrawn. So this eighty thousand would go away uh, by way of this dividend. Uh, you would receive a T five slip, and you would pay income tax on that eighty thousand dollars. And it, this is like this is what we do. Other accountants do every year when you're going through year-end filings uh, is determine how much that dividend should be. And uh, something that your accountant can help with the, the earlier that you give them the information for the year-end, the better, uh, because there is a filing deadline of February 28th uh, for the T5 slip to determine uh, what that dividend uh, needs to be. Okay, the next topic is uh, this. Uh, topic of personal service businesses. And um, this has been uh, the topic of some CRA audits lately. Uh, it's something that's been around for a long time, but we have seen some, some letters and questionnaires from CRA. So we just want to make sure that everybody's aware of it and the potential risks. Um, so the, the definition of a personal services business is a business that a corporation carries on to provide services to another entity that an officer or employee of that entity would usually perform. Now, what that means is if, 
if you do, uh, and typically you, if you do work for one company or one client, for example, and you have sort of all the characteristics as if you work there as an employee, uh, for example, they sort of dictate, uh, you have an annual salary, they dictate the hours you work. Uh, you might even have vacation or benefits, uh, but the company says to you, hey, you know what, uh, why don't you incorporate and charge us through your corporation? Uh, this is what this is trying to catch. Um, it's, it's not a bright line test. There are scenarios where if you are working for only one client uh, that you might not be a personal services business, but it might, it's just something to keep aware, uh, keep in mind that this rule is out there. Um, because the consequences of being deemed this personal service business are quite harsh. Um, you, what happens if CRA says that you're really an incorporated employee and you really should be getting a T4, you shouldn't be paid, uh, pay, paid through your corporation, uh, you lose access to the small business deduction uh, and you actually get taxed at a higher rate than you would have had you just earned the income personally. Uh, and you're not allowed to deduct many items against your business income. Uh, so it's, it's really a bad situation. The worst case scenario, you end up paying tax at a 63% tax rate. It might even be higher now, but it's, it's, it's much higher than the 53% top tax rate. Uh, so it's just something if you're in a situation where uh, you have the opportunity to work as a consultant and in, incorporate, uh, just to have someone take a look at it and explain to you the risks and make sure that you're, you're protected uh, before getting into something like this. Uh, the, these scenarios are very common. Uh, there are consultants working for various tech companies that incorporate and they've operated like this for years and CRA hasn't really caught on to them, but I, I have seen letters starting to come now. Uh, so I think they're, they're becoming, the CRA is becoming more and more aware of this and it's just something to, to consider if you're going down this road. And I, I should just mention one point there that this is not trying to catch legitimate businesses uh, that uh, have incorporated. Like if you've started a small business and you just happen to have only one customer because you're growing like that, it's these rules are not intended to catch you. Uh, it, it's, it's really the ones where you're working full time for one person, 40 hours a week, uh, that really you're an employee versus you have your own business and you happen to be making sales just to one person. Uh, so talking about payroll a little bit, um, so when you're paying someone from your from your company or as a sole proprietor, uh, you have two options. Uh, uh, you either pay them as an employee or as a contractor. And this sort of comes down to the same determination as with the personal service business. Uh, if someone really is an employee, then you're going to pay them a salary versus a contractor is going to receive fees. Uh, you'll pay them HST if they're registered for HST. Um, so if you have employees and you pay salaries, you have to register with with CRA and have a payroll account, and you have to make those tax withholdings uh, typically every month, uh, more frequently if you're a larger company, perhaps quarterly if you're smaller, uh, but you have to withhold the taxes, CPP, EI, if it's an employee that's not, uh, not related to you, um, and you have to pay your employees a net paycheck and remit the, uh, the difference to CRA. Uh, if you're just paying yourself for maybe yourself and one other person, it might be easy enough to do it yourself. Uh, but there are many payroll service providers out there that offer a service that automatically calculate all this. They, they take the payroll withholdings right from your bank. They do it all for you. Uh, it's just one less thing you have to worry about. Uh, and some of the services are relatively inexpensive. Uh, so I'd recommend looking into uh, to a payroll service provider if you're going to be paying employees uh, just to take away that extra burden of uh, having to track uh, your withholdings and then also having to file T4 slips for all the employees at the end of the year. Uh, the payroll service provider will, will usually take care of that for you as well. And since they've been doing the payroll the whole year, it's a pretty easy process. So just some notes on some rates and other things that uh, related to payroll that you may have to pay. Uh, so the CPP uh, is, Continuing to go up, they revamped the uh, the CPP program a number of years ago, and uh, there's been this phase in period where the CPP rates have increased every year. So we're we're now up to 5.7%, uh, up to a maximum of 64,900 of earnings. Uh, and as Tushar mentioned, uh, a 
as a sole proprietor, you have to pay double that rate. So it's it's a quite significant cost. Uh, as a sole proprietor, you're paying more than 11% of your first $65,000 of earnings towards CPP. Uh, and the same goes if you're paying yourself uh, through a corporation. Uh, you have to withhold the employee portion of the CVP and you have to pay the employer portion. So it's double, it's, a, it's almost $7,000 a year. Uh, employment insurance or EI, uh, that's at 1.58% up to 60,300. Again, uh, that's only if you're paying someone typically not related to you, there's more complex rules, but if you're not paying yourself or your spouse, uh, you typically have to pay the EI uh, to an unrelated uh, employee. Uh, and if you're the one paying the payroll, you also have to pay 1.4 times the amount as the employer share. Uh, so there's uh, there's kind of more than more than double of the EI that you have to pay to CRA. Uh, employer health tax, uh, the exemption has gone up to a million dollars of payroll. So generally, small businesses don't have to worry about paying the EHT. Uh, but just a reminder that if you do and find yourself in a situation where you have more than a million dollars of payroll. Uh, the EHT will start to kick in. Uh, WSIB, uh, unless you're just paying yourself, uh, every business has to register for WSIB uh, if they have employees and pay uh, premium rates, uh, depending on the industry of the business. And uh, uh, that that even applies just if you're to office workers. So uh, you may think you hear WSIB and you think more dangerous jobs like construction, uh, even office workers have to pay WSIB. So if you have employees that are not just the owner, uh, something to look into to make sure that you're uh, on site. Just a couple other items on business income uh, with uh, record keeping. Uh, so there is a requirement to keep records for a period of six years from the end of the tax year to which they relate. So that kind of gives you a seven year window where you have to keep books and records uh, because they could be requested by CRA. Uh, an exception to this uh, where the time period is longer is if it relates to something like a capital asset. So let's say, for example, you bought a building uh, that you use in your business. Um, the purchase record from that building has to be kept until seven years after you sell the building. So you could have to maintain these documents for quite a long time. But uh, general day-to-day -day expenses, receipts like that, uh, typically seven years, then you can get rid of them. Uh, or if you file them electronically, I mean, you. You could get rid of them if you need space, but uh, it's a lot easier to keep older records these days with, with most things being electronic. Uh, and as Tushar mentioned, we have a bookkeeping session coming up, uh, but just generally, a lot of times I get asked, should I hire a bookkeeper? When's the right time? Uh, I find if you if if your business is, uh, has started to kind of get going and you have more than more than just a few transactions every month and it, uh, it's starting to take up a lot of your time to keep track of everything, uh, it may be worthwhile just looking into what options are out there to have someone come in, whether it's once a quarter, once every six months, or even once a year, if there's not that many transactions, and just have uh, have proper books and records maintained. Um, I think it, it really helps at the end uh, of the year for tax time. Uh, if you have a bookkeeper who's keeping track of everything, they can just provide that file to your accountant who's filing your tax returns. It uh, makes things a lot easier uh, if everything is sort of all tracked versus versus having a pile of receipts at the end of the year uh, and having to go through all that. Uh, there's a lot of apps these days that let you track things like uh, you can take pictures of your receipts and it's automatically uploaded. Uh, Tushar mentioned the mileage app. So there are a lot of things that uh, automate the process uh, where you uh, before where you may have needed a bookkeeper if you're comfortable with that automation and, and the process that's involved uh, you could do some of it yourself uh, but I think there there always comes a point where the transaction volume just gets too heavy and uh, it's it's probably better to uh, to have a bookkeeper so in terms of getting ready for for your end and sort of what what is your accountant going to ask you for uh, this isn't all encompassing but if uh, just to some general things to be thinking about that you should be keeping track of. Uh, if you're incorporated, and uh, especially if you've incorporated for the first year, uh, the accountant will need the articles of incorporation. Uh, they'll need a set of financial statements. So if, if you have someone doing the bookkeeping or if you're doing it yourself, for example, in something like QuickBooks or Xero, um, that you'll have a set of financial statements that you can provide. 
uh, as long uh, as well as the uh, detailed general ledger. So that just shows all the transactions during the year. Uh, other things that you might not have kept track of uh, that gets posted at the end of the year, your home office expenses, your vehicle log for auto expenses, payroll information, um, any any sort of asset purchases or dispositions, so larger capital assets that are have a longer life, uh, bank statements, credit card statements, loan statements, uh, any correspondence from CRA. Uh, usually your accountant can get a lot of that online, but uh, just helpful to sort of make sure that we've got it all. Uh, and any amounts that you've paid by installments during the year. Again, not an all-encompassing list, but just gives you an idea of sort of if you're just starting out and starting your own business for the first time, uh, this is sort of generally what is asked for at the end of the year. Okay. Okay. Just gonna wrap up with some uh, GST, uh, HST basics. Uh, uh, the HST is a very complicated area or it can get very complicated depending on the situation. Uh, so I just wanna provide some high level points just Kind of focus towards new businesses and uh, what to things to consider uh, when registering and and really what it is. Uh, so I'm sure everyone's familiar with the HST. It's a 13% that's charged on most items. Uh, and if you're registered for for HST and you uh, produce a taxable supply, uh, you have to charge the HST. Uh, so in Ontario, that's the 13%. Um, and when you collect that 13% you're really collecting that on behalf of the CRA and you have to pay that 13% to CRA. Uh, but what you pay to CRA is offset by any HST that you pay on your expenses. So really you file your tax, uh, your GST return, which is separate from your income tax return. And you take the amount that you collected, the 13% minus any amounts you paid and that net amount is what you So whether or not you have to register, there's this test of whether whether you have more than thirty thousand dollars of revenues uh, over the for any single calendar quarter or over the last four consecutive quarters. So over the last year, uh, once you hit that mark, uh, you have to register for HST. You don't have a choice. Um, if you wanted to, if you're starting up a business uh, and you wanted to register from the beginning, uh, you don't have to meet this thirty thousand threshold. Uh, you can register right away. Uh, and there's downsides and benefits to it. The downside is you now have to charge an extra 13% to your customers. And if your customers aren't registered for HST, that's an extra cost for them. Uh, but you get to get to claim any HST that you paid uh, against the HST you owe. So you might have some savings there. Uh, there is a bit of extra tracking that you have to do to uh, now file an HST return, either annually or quarterly or monthly. Um, the bigger you get, the more frequently you have to file, or you, uh, and you can choose to file uh, more frequently if you choose. Uh, in order to register, you need a business number. Uh, if you're incorporated in Ontario as a corporation, you'll automatically have a business number. Uh, and then you can go, the easiest way is online. Uh, you can go through the process to uh, register online. Uh, if you are a sole proprietor, you'll have to register for a business number because you don't automatically get one as a sole proprietor. Uh, I mentioned the reporting periods already, uh, so I won't go through this in detail, but just you have the annual, quarterly, or monthly options. Uh, one thing to consider is uh, if you file annually and you owe more than $3,000 of HST in the year, uh, similar to the income tax, like Tushar mentioned, uh, you have to start paying the tax in, in quarterly installments. So once you get to that level, we usually recommend doing a, uh, the HST return quarterly. Uh, because you have to make an estimated tax payment anyway, so probably better to just uh, figure out what you owe for that three months and pay the actual amount, especially if you have an off season or off quarter, uh, so you're not paying more than you have to. So there's three different types of supplies uh, uh, of tax or taxable supplies. Uh, the, the main one is that last one, the non-zero rated taxable supplies. So that's if you're providing almost any kind of service or selling most goods, uh, you're going to be paying or charging the 13% or paying the 13%. Um, exempt supplies are very specific things like used housing, healthcare, childcare, education, financial services, you won't see the HST on that. Uh, then there's some that are zero rated. There's a bit of a nuance between exempt and zero rated, but 
uh, for purposes of this presentation, just, there's no HST that's charged on them. Uh, so uh, some food that's more groceries, uh, not, not fast food, uh, prescribed medications, medical devices, uh, exports. Just uh, as part of your bookkeeping process, something to keep in mind that uh, if you're registered for HST, uh, you do have to track all the amounts you're collecting and paying because you have to file a separate return for the for the HST. So that really concludes our presentation portion. Uh, just a, a recap of sort of what we talked about. Uh, it, this presentation is really to give you a, a high level general idea of what the difference is between a sole proprietor and a corporation. Uh, we do have another presentation uh, with uh, to the series on uh, incorporating and, and more about that if you're interested. Um, and uh, we've given you a general idea of sort of how your income is taxed depending on what uh, what form you're in and if you're a sole proprietor or a corporation, uh, different kinds of expenses, when to pay tax, uh, thinking some common misconceptions about incorporating and what incorporating really means and the benefit. Uh, personal service businesses and just watching out for those incorporated employee rules uh, and some general uh, thoughts on payroll, record keeping, HST. Uh, yeah, we only have 40, 45 minutes to go through it all as we covered a lot. So you'll, you'll have access to the slides to take a look. Um, but uh, this is just sort of to get you thinking if you're, especially if you're starting out for the first time uh, on your own, um, sort of what to expect uh, for your first tax season. Uh, maybe thinking about uh, talking to an accountant at this point, uh, just to, to make sure that you're ready for your filings for, for next year. So we'll, we'll open it up to questions if anyone has any. I don't see any right now, but feel free to use the Q&A if, uh, if you have anything, uh, anything further you'd like to ask. Awesome. While we give everyone a chance, I just want to remind everyone that, that this is uh, a series being uh, presented in partnership with uh, MNP. So we have uh, next Wednesday, same time, 12 p.m., uh, incorporating your business. The following Wednesday on November 2nd uh, is the bookkeeping session, which uh, you guys both mentioned. And then November 9th is business valuations for investor conversations. So we hope that uh, everyone on today's call will, will think about joining us for the upcoming sessions. We know it's, we're going to be filled with lots of great information on it. Uh, looks like there's another question that's come yeah. in. Yeah, so, so do you have any uh, accounting CPA advisor services that you can refer? Uh, so yeah, we... Uh, we're uh, MMP is sort of an accounting tax advisory firm. So uh, if you're if you're interested, you can reach out to myself or to Shar. And uh, depending on the type of services that you're looking for, we can refer you to the right person at MMP that uh, that can help. And uh, depending on location too, like we're in we're in Peel here. So if you're you're local here, then uh, someone in our office can probably help you out. I think there's another question that might be more for uh, for Jennifer, if you want to take it. I think you're on mute, uh, Jennifer. Sorry, thanks. Um, so to book an appointment with any of our advisors, if you are uh, located in Brampton, you can do so um, on our website, and I will put uh, the direct link to our um, consultation or request. You can book. Uh, a meeting with one of our advisors directly online. Um, and we do consultations for people that are uh, exploring entrepreneurship, those that might be in the process of starting a business, or um, individuals that are already established and are looking for help in, in scaling their business. So I'm going to put that in the question box so everyone has access to that link. Uh, I guess also to mention, we do run a free co-working space. So for any entrepreneurs that are located in Brampton that might be looking for more of a collaborative space to work on your ideas and your business, we do offer the free co-working through the Entrepreneur Center. Um, you would have to apply for free membership. Uh, and folks are welcome to use the space. Right now we're open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 9 till 4 p.m. Um, and the space is available. For entrepreneurs to come and work 
collaborate with other entrepreneurs as well as access um, our phone booths and um, meetings. We've got a few more questions come in. I uh, take the, the personal service business one. So I know most contracted IT staff for banks are forced to incorporate. So they're really a personal service business. How come the banks and individuals are getting away with this then? Yeah, great, uh, great question. Um, yeah, it, it, it has been sort of the industry norm for a very long time. Uh, I think I've come across it and we've just make sure that the, our clients are sort of aware of the, the risk that they're taking uh, if they, and um, if, if possible, if they can try to have more than one client, uh, that sort of helps their case. Uh, but it is something we are seeing more and more letters on recently. So they might not be getting away with it for, for too long. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, I think it's just the, because the, the really the risk is on the incorporated employee, the, the banks or the IT companies that like, don't really have the risk. It's more the person who's incorporating is taking that risk. So the offer for the job uh, and the benefits that you're getting by, by doing the job uh, need to, um, need to kind of outweigh the potential tax tax risk. And it's really an individual decision. Right, and that individual can always talk to their accountant before they accept that offer if the structure makes sense for them. Um, I can answer the next question. So the question is, is there any specific taxation aspects for a recruitment incorporation? So I think this question is asking, um, is there anything specific they need to know for a recruitment business and they're considering whether or not to incorporate? Um, I would say no. Um, once again, it's up to you and uh, what, how, how does this suit your needs? If you are okay with just uh, you know, doing it individually, so if you're comfortable with taxing yourself as a sole proprietor, your business is small and you need all the money, uh, there's no advantage in the tax deferral, then you can continue to uh, tax yourself as a sole proprietor. But once again, to go back to Jacob's points, if you are getting bigger, you know, you think that you don't need all the money that you're making, you can look into incorporating and realize the tax referral advantages by incorporating your recruitment business. Um, next question, and the, the similar concept applies to the next question. When operating as a sole proprietor, do you need to have a separate bank account and credit card, or is it okay to use my personal one? So once again, it, um, it really depends on how complex your business is. If it's fairly simple, you can start out with um, just your personal bank account. And when it, when it comes time for the year end, and the tax time, if it's easy for you to separate out those expenses and income, sure, you can go ahead and continue to use your personal one. But once you do start, uh, once your business does start scaling upwards, we would recommend having a separate bank account and credit card, um, just so it's easier for you and your accountant to just see the business operations. And also banks can provide you, um, you know, more incentives for having a business account um, on the side, as opposed to a personal one. Yeah, I just want to mention that that's only really for a sole proprietor. As soon as you incorporate, then you definitely need to have right. a separate bank account. For sure, yeah. Uh, do you want me to take the next one? Uh, uh, sure, the deferral the, one, yeah. The deferral, is it applicable for an IT consultant or somewhere where you actually show reinvestment into the business, machinery, et cetera? Uh, so it's really applicable to, to anyone earning income in a corporation, uh, as long as you keep that money in the company. So you don't have to reinvest it in the same business. Uh, but for example, like uh, your corporation could open up an investment account like with a, with a bank or some sort of online broker uh, and you can make investments. Uh, you can buy real estate. Uh, as long as you're using that money for something that's not personal use, uh, you are getting the advantage of that deferral uh, by keeping it in the company. It's when you take that money out and spend it personally that's where you don't get the deferral advantage, but it doesn't really matter the type of business as long as it's an active business that you're paying that 12.2% to the 26.5%. Uh, take the next one. What is best for real estate wholesaling and does a person need to be a Canadian citizen for a corporation or sole proprietorship? Uh, I don't believe there's any requirement to be a Canadian citizen. Uh, if, if you're living here, uh, I think they uh, they even relaxed the rules that you don't even need an Ontario address anymore for the direct director of an Ontario corporation. Um, so I think you can start a corporation uh, uh, or sole proprietorship. I think anyone can really start a sole proprietorship. Uh, uh, 
the in terms of the real estate wholesaling, I think it, it it's uh, again like Tushar said, it, it's it's really going to depend on the facts and the uh, specific situation of your business, the size of it, what your future plans are for it. Uh, there's no real incorporate if you're in this industry, don't if you're in the other. Uh, so I think it's probably a conversation to have with your accountant uh, to just go through what you're planning on doing and, and what makes sense given the, the facts of your situation. Yeah. So I can take the next one. Um, what are the options available if we miss any annual incorporation tax filing? So the deadlines that we mentioned in this presentation, yes, they are our deadlines, but the government will still let you file late for your tax returns. And we always recommend that obviously you file on time just because they're, you know, you don't want to pay any interest or penalties if you do owe tax um, if you're late. But definitely don't be, don't avoid trying to be in arrears for filings for multiple years. Um, and a specific example I can give you is that starting out when people incorporate, you know, in the first few years, they, you will realize losses. That's just how it is because you have a lot of, um, it's a very, if you have a capital intensive business, you have a lot more expenses and revenue when you start out, you do have losses. So make sure you still file on time just because the government can't deny those losses in the future if you don't file your tax returns on time. But uh, to summarize the answer, the government will still allow you to file late, but they will charge interest and penalties if you owe tax. Just one more point on that too. Uh, if you are behind and, and there are penalties applicable, uh, there is a voluntary disclosure program. Uh, it's really a one-time sort of ask for forgiveness from the CRA program uh, that you are allowed to catch up uh, and you ask CRA to uh, to waive any penalties and potential interest uh, that might apply. Uh, so that would be something to look into if you're owing a substantial amount of tax. Uh, one of the criteria is that the CRA can't be after you for those tax returns. So if they've made a phone call or sent a letter saying we need this filed, you, you wouldn't be eligible for that program. Uh, definitely something that an accountant would be able to help with. Uh, uh, it's it's a bit of a complex uh, process to do it yourself. And to specify further, uh, the late filing that also applies to HST returns. If you if you or your corporation is registered for HST, you can file those late as well. And the last question we've got right now: uh, What are the tax considerations to be taken care of if any Canadian corporation is investing in a U.S. based incorporation? Uh, so that question, unfortunately, is a uh, very complex question and has. That really, it depends. Uh, I would just recommend that uh, you need to get cross-border advice. Uh, like, for example, like we've got a cross-border team here who deals with Canadians investing in the U.S. Um, there's just a lot of different tax rules that can apply depending on what uh, what type of corporation the U in the U.S. it is, what percentage you own, uh, what type of business they're operating. There, there's just there's way too many variables to to kind of give a one-size-fits-all answer. Uh, so it's just something we always recommend to, to get advice from someone who's done this before, uh, because it, the the uh, the potential for doing something that results in double tax or even worse uh, is pretty high. Uh, so just uh, recommend it to get professional advice if you're looking at uh, cross border. Uh, and then just quickly, uh, can an incorporation open a TFSA account? Uh, no. Uh, so TFSAs are only for individuals. Right. Uh, Corporation, like there's there's other sort of, you can open a normal non-registered account with a corporation, but you're going to pay tax with it, uh, on it. Uh, there's there's other kind of more complicated uh, structures with insurance where you can have sort of an investment account with an insurance account, but but generally speaking, uh, you're going to pay tax on any investments you're making inside the corporation. So you, you may want to use your, take the money out and use that towards your TFSA first if it makes sense. And then keep any excess after the TFSA in, in the company. Yeah, and that can get fairly complex. So this, uh, what Jacob talked about, the tax on the investment income, that's where we get into the refundable tax issues. So definitely talk to your accountant before you do decide to invest any excess funds um, in a portfolio through your corporation. Yeah, it, it does It does increase the complexity and uh, potentially the fees of filing your tax return if you have investments. But uh, again, that deferral advantage will probably outweigh any any cost of, of filing, uh, but just something to get advice on before you go ahead and do something. Wonderful. Thank you both. Lots of great questions and a, and a really great presentation. So thank you both for your time this morning and thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, we will be following up, um, as mentioned, this afternoon with the link to the recording as well as a copy of the slide deck.
So hope to see everyone next week for incorporating your small business and uh, some of the upcoming questions. So thanks again, everyone. It's one o'clock. We're ending late right on time. I love that. <laughs> thanks again, everyone. Have a terrific day. Thank you. Take Thank care. you, everyone.